Bismillah here Rahman near Rahim. Jihad is not terrorism. Ghulam Ahmad Pawe. Translated by Shahid Chowdhury. 4. Jihad. 5. Slavery. According to Greek philosophers the universe is static. This belief resulted in Stoicism which means that one should lead a quiet, inactive, monotonous, hermetic life. Shun society, and not have any sense of the values or joys of human coexistence. This pessimistic philosophy withered the leaves, plucked the fruits and dried up the branches of the tree of humanity. When the Messenger of Islam began his mission, this philosophy was dominated the thinking minds of the world in various ways. The Quran contradicted this listless and destructive philosophy of life and said that the universe is not static. It is ever-expanding in which every particle is changing and moving forward so as to live. The name of this endeavor is jihad. The meaning of jihad. Jihad is the opposite of could. To sit idly without making an effort. This makes it clear that jihad means to be active, to struggle, to strive and to endeavor. Those of the believers who sit still, other than those who have a disabling hurt are not on equality with those who strive and struggle in the way of Allah with their wealth and lives. Allah has conferred on those who strive and struggle with their wealth and lives a rank above the sedentary. To each Allah has promised well, but he has bestowed on those who strive a great reward above the sedentary. 4. 95. Therefore, jihad means action. Reading the Quran from start to finish, one finds aiman and action emphasized throughout. Aiman is, to determine an objective. Action means striving and struggling in order to obtain that objective. That is the jihad of a Muslim. It includes everything from the smallest chore to the ultimate sacrifice that a man can make. So, in order to crush the forces of oppression and tyranny, a Muslim is prepared to lay down his life if circumstances so demand. As such, ketal, armed combat, is also included in jihad. This means that every jihad is not war. The life of a Muslim is jihad from birth to death because only by jihad is the glory of human evolution maintained and human personality developed. If any Muslim strives and struggles then he does it for the development of his own personality because Allah is free of all needs from all creation. 29. 6 and the ways to the destination of the caravan of life are shown by jihad. And Allah would certainly guide those who strive and struggle in the cause of the truth to his path. The destination. Because without doubt Allah is with those who lead righteous lives. 29. 69. The path of the Muslims. For a Muslim, jihad is the only path that can lead him to Allah. O oh Muslims! Adhere strictly to the laws of Allah. Try to secure a high rank in his eyes. You will be successful in your efforts by striving and struggling hard in his cause. 5. 35. Without jihad jana, life of peace and security, is a distant dream, impossible to realize. O oh Muslims! What do you think? You will enter Janet just by declaring that you believe in Allah. No. You have yet to prove which of you have strived and struggled hard and have endured steadfastly. 3. 141. Jihad exalts one in ranks. Those who believe in Allah and the life hereafter, and abandon their homes and struggle in the cause of Allah with their possessions and their persons, rank high in the estimation of Allah. These are the ones who will attain success. 9. 20. By jihad one becomes a candidate for Allah's Rama. Means of protection and sources of nourishment. Without doubt those who believe in the divine order, migrate. Leave their homes surahs too. Strive and struggle in the cause of Allah are the ones who can rightfully expect and receive Allah's Rama. 2. 218. By jihad one becomes prosperous and pleasantly ingenious.
But the Messenger and his companions, who believe in Allah, strive and struggle in the cause of divine order with their lives and their possessions. All good things of life are for them and they shall prosper. Allah has prepared for them gardens wherein flow streams and where they shall abide. This indeed is a great achievement. 9. 88-89. Life of a Muslim. Ponder over the life of a Muslim. He is born into the world in order to live in accordance with divine laws and implement them in the world. He does not change according to the system in which he is born. Rather, he tries to change the system according to his ideology. For this change he sacrifices everything that he has, simply because for him his life and wealth are not an end in themselves but a means to achieve a lofty goal. That objective is to implement the divine order in the world. This revolution is the objective of the life of a Muslim. And to achieve this goal he has to strive and struggle hard. This then is jihad. The Quran in simple but impressive style narrates this fact. It states that a Muslim is the guardian of his life and wealth and not the owner. Allah has purchased of the believers. In the divine order their persons and the goods. For there, in return, is Janet, peace and security. They fight in his cause, and slay and are slain. A promise binding on him in truth, through the Torah, Old Testament, the Gospel, New Testament, and the Quran and who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah. Then rejoice in the bargain, which you have concluded. That is the achievement supreme. 9. 111. In this business there is no loss and no setback, only pure gain. O oh, you who believe, in the divine order, shall I tell you of a business that will save you from a grievous chastisement? If you believe in Allah and his messenger then strive and struggle hard in the cause of Allah with your wealth and your persons. This bargain is best for you, if you but only knew. 61. 10 to 11. Upholding the truth. The universe has been created in truth. Therefore, the ideological mission of a Muslim's life is to uphold this truth so as to establish the divine system. He is born for this. And endeavor in the cause of Allah because it is your right to strive and struggle in his cause. He has chosen you for a glorious life. For you there is no hardship in deen system of life. The way of life of your father Abraham is also your way of life. He has named you Muslim. This was your name in earlier scriptures and in this Quran. This is because the messenger is witness over your deeds and you are witness over the rest of the mankind. So establish the system of Salat, political order, and Zakat economic system for the welfare of the entire humanity. Hold fast. The laws of Allah. He is your protecting friend. The blessed patron and the blessed helper. 22. 78. This, then, according to the Quran is striving and struggling regularly in the way of truth and justice. This is also the blessed philosophy of regular effort and inquiry in which are concealed the secrets of life. O Muslims, respond to the call of Allah and his messenger when he calls you so that you may get life. 8. 24. Eternal life. A call to life means to create an atmosphere in which humanus thrives. Therefore, mere breathing is not life. Similarly, death is not when breathing stops. The Quran states that those who die in this struggle should not be called dead. They are alive. But we do not understand this fact because we think life ends when one stops breathing. During the struggle for the establishment of the divine order one should be prepared even to face death. If one dies in this struggle one should not be considered dead because one has attained eternal life even though it cannot be perceived. By your present level of knowledge. 2. 154. Even to entertain the thought that a striver in the cause of Allah is dead is prohibited. 
Do not ever think that those who have been slain in the cause of Allah are dead. Say, they are alive with Allah, well provided with sustenance, rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them. They are glad because of their sacrifice those who have been left behind are free of fear and anxiety. 3. 168. Therefore, according to the Quran, life is motion and action. When there is no movement and action, it is death though physical life may be of any length. Life without dignity is no life. That is the secret of the life of an individual or that of a community. Why nations rise and fall? Why do nations rise and fall? There are many answers to this question. One principle is common to all of them in all ages. Only the nation which had the enthusiasm to evolve and to move forward and had the passion to strive for its existence ever survived. But the moment its organs of thought and action exhausted, it was wiped out as if they were Lamyakanshe and Maskura. A thing unremembered. Ordinary people search external reasons and defects for this fall. But external reasons and defects are like ants carrying a dead insect from one place to another. Nations fall because their internal forces become weak and disorderly. According to the Quran, enthusiasm to evolve and passion to strive is an immutable law. Therefore, it unambiguously states to the community that has been chosen to protect mankind. The secret of your existence is in struggling and striving hard. If you will shy foul from this obligation then other communities will take your place and your history will become stories of the past. O oh Muslims! What has happened to you? When you are asked to march forth in the cause of Allah you do not move as if your feet are rooted in the earth. It seems. You prefer worldly gains to the blessings of the hereafter although the gains offered by the life of this world are insignificant in comparison to what the life of the hereafter offers. Remember, if you do not march forth Allah will certainly chastise you with a serious chastisement. He will replace you by another people. You can do no harm to Allah since he has control over everything. 9. 38 to 39. The secret of life lies in fighting and defeating the forces of evil. Besides, this struggle takes stock of one's strength and thereby one can gauge as to how much talent one has to live and to move forward. This stock taking will take different forms. This struggle will provide you with many opportunities to test your mettle. You may encounter wars and massacres and also be confronted with scarcity of food and loss of life and property or with devastation of fields and orchards. Such ordeals may take place but ultimately those who remain steadfast and do not waver in their commitment to establish Allah's system will be successful. They meet every challenge saying. We have dedicated ourselves to the establishment of the divine system and come what may we will continue advancing towards that goal. They are the people who are considered to be eminently deserving of blessings and laudation by their creator and sustainer. They will certainly attain the goal. 2. 155-157. It happened to generations gone by and it will happen to us. There is no change in the laws of Allah. One will not be exempted from this law simply because of claiming to be a Muslim. One's belief in the divine order will be tested. In this test one's actions would count not words. Do men think that they will be left alone on saying, we believe, and they will not be tested? Mere lip profession of faith is not enough. They will be tried and tested in the real turmoil of life. And remember, we did test generations before them so as to tell them who were true and who were false. 29. 2-3. Putting up lame excuses. For this test there is no better touchstone than jihad. The Quran unambiguously states this fact in the second section of chapter 48, Surah Al-Fath. The Victory.
Besides, this section unveils various types of prevarications and false excuses by people who hung back from the duty of jihad. Though the immediate reference in these verses is in context of the period when the Quran was being revealed, it has generalized connotation that is not confined in time, space and peoples. However, amongst Muslims this sickness of shying away from the duty of jihad began taking roots when the vibrant and life-giving message of Allah was replaced by Persian and Greek thoughts. In short, Sufism fatally injured the enthusiasm of Muslims to struggle and to strive. Sufism. The decline of Muslim power is directly related to the rise of Sufism, for Sufism preached that the biggest jihad is purgation of the self. And this is done by sitting idly in dark and narrow cells of a monastery and repeatedly uttering the name of Allah. This un-Islamic thought gained ground despite clear instructions and exposition in the Quran about the greater jihad. Jihad e Akbar. Fala tuti il kafrina wa jahad hum bahe jihad in ka bira. O Messenger! Do not follow those who reject the truth, but strive against them with the utmost strenuousness in accordance with the Quran. 25. 52. Notable is the phrase fala tuti il kafrina in the above verse unambiguously clarifying the meaning of jihad e akbar, strive and struggle. Jahid hum bahay. In accordance with the laws enshrined in the Quran against the forces that oppose the divine order till obedience remains only for the laws of Allah. Division by the clergy. The Quran states that the anchorites and the priests hinder men from the way of Allah. 9. 34. We have seen how Sufis led the Muslims astray. Now let us consider the part played by the priests. They introduced an innovative concept of division of labor in Islam. According to this, war is for the army and the duty of the priests is to legislate in religious affairs and also to issue religious edicts. The Quran nowhere mentions this grouping. The very idea has been borrowed from the Manu Simriti of the Hindus. According to the Quran, enjoining good and forbidding evil is the duty of all Muslims and so is war. In Islam, there is no room for a separate class of priests. 5. Slavery. What is human history? It is a story of the hunter and the prey written in blood. Every section of this story is both gruesome and pathetic. But the most morbid part is slavery being a disgraceful blot on humanity. What can be worse than considering fellow human beings your chattel and keep them like cattle? Even this comparison does not give the true picture of the conditions of slaves. The owner of cattle does not throw them to the wolves. But slaves have been actors in this drama too. The best loved diversion of the innately barbarous and inhuman Romans was to throw a helpless slave into the cage of a hungry lion and watch them fight for dear life. Special arenas were prepared for this sport. When the last messenger began his ministry, he saw that slaves were an important part of the society. But, for this flag-bearer of human equality that he was, this ignominy to humanity was intolerable. He declared that it is not legal for a man to consider another man his property. All men are human beings and therefore equal. This is against human honor and dignity that man should be considered a commodity or cattle. Freedom is the birthright of man. In a human society slavery should come to an end. Prisoners of war. At that time, the tradition in the world was that the prisoners of war were taken slaves and subsequently their children were considered born slaves. The Quran closed this fountainhead of slavery. It prohibited making slaves of prisoners of war. They would be released either by taking ransom or in good faith. Now when you meet in battle your opponents then it is smiting of the necks until you have rooted them. Then bind fast the bonds. Then either give them a free dismissal afterwards or exact a ransom. 47. 4. Slaves of pre-Quranic times. 
The prisoners of war till their release remained state guests. After the closure of the fountain the river of slavery would have dried up on its own. But some time was required for this drying up process. The river already had some water and an outlet for it had to be made. At that time slaves were a common feature of almost every Arab household. Slaves worked on their agricultural lands and slave girls did household chores. In this way they had become an integral part of their social and economic life. By freeing them in one stroke would have created complete disorder and chaos in the Arab society of the time. Not only the masters but also the slaves would have found themselves in difficulties. Besides, the Muslims themselves were not in a position to make proper arrangements for all the freed slaves. Therefore, the circumstances demanded that the process of freeing the slaves and the slave girls be carried out in steps and not on block. Moreover, only in this way they could have adjusted to the demands of a free society. These slaves, as said earlier, already existed in the Arab society. The Quran has called them Ma Malakat Imanukum, those who are in your possession. All orders of the Quran in the context of slavery are for these slaves only. Once they gained freedom, the very concept of slavery met its doom. For the slaves who existed were slowly but steadily absorbed in the free society and there was no scope for recruiting new ones. The phrase Ma Malakat Imanukum is in the past tense. At every place in the Quran only this tense is used for the slaves. This shows that the Quran is referring to only those slaves and slave girls who already existed in the Arab society. Methods. The Quran employed various methods for the emancipation and betterment of the slaves who already existed. Ma Malakat Imanukum. In the Arab society. First of all it encouraged people to free slaves. The Muslims were urged to be kind and considerate to their slaves. They were told that to emancipate a slave was a meritorious act. They could atone for some of their offenses by setting a slave free. A Muslim would never kill another Muslim except by mistake. If he kills another Muslim by mistake he should set free a believing slave and pay blood money to the family of the deceased. 4. 92. Freeing the slaves was also to atone for frivolous oaths. If you have taken an oath not to partake a particular lawful thing, mind it that Allah holds you accountable only for oaths taken with serious intent and not for frivolous oaths. The atonement for breaking serious oaths is the feeding of ten poor persons with such food as your family eats, or providing clothes to them or setting a slave free. 5. 89. If a person in a fit of anger calls his wife his mother to declare his intention of not having any sexual relationship with her at all. This was called zihar. This practice now became an offense and could be atoned by setting a slave free. But those who pronounce the word zihar, mother etc., in state of anger, to their wives then wish to go back on the words they uttered. It is ordained that such a one should free a slave. 58. 3. Today, it is hard to understand the difficulty the Arabs had to undergo in such atonements. We can hardly imagine how valuable a slave was to them. It immensely affected their social and economic life because slaves had become part and parcel of their society. In such circumstances it was an act of great courage to free a slave. Hence the Quran has compared it with scaling a mountain during which man loses his breath at every step. But even after these facts, man does not gather strength to scale a mountain. And do you know what scaling a mountain means? It is freeing a slave. 90. 11 to 13. Manumission. If a slave was noticed to possess the potential to contribute positively to the society by being a free person, a deed for his emancipation was written. 
Besides, he was given economic support to begin a new life. And if any of your slaves ask for a deed in writing for emancipation, then give them such a deed if you know any good in them. Besides, give them something yourselves out of the means which Allah has given to you. 24. 33. After this, the Quran said that marriages of the slaves and the slave girls should be solemnized so that they may begin their family lives and thereby become virtuous members of the society. Marry those among you who are single, and the eligible ones among your slaves, male or female. 24. 32. It was decreed that not just the slaves but also free citizens should marry the slave girls. Whoever amongst you cannot afford to marry a free believing woman may marry a believing slave girl. If you marry a slave girl do not treat her as inferior. Because once she accepts Islam and marries you she is at par with others. Allah knows all about your amen conviction in the divine order and following it. Remember the only consideration for distinction is Amen, otherwise. The one of you is as the other. 4. 25. Good behavior. The masters were instructed to behave properly with good manners with your slaves. One's behavior towards them should be as good as it was towards one's parents and other near relatives. And in dealing with your relatives you must strictly adhere to the laws of Allah and no man-made law should be mixed with them. Accordingly you should do well to a. Parents b. Kinfolk c. Orphans d. Others in need e. Neighbors irrespective of whether they are your relatives or not f. Wayfarers who stand in need of your help and g. Those in your charge. Slaves or those who work under you. Allah does not like those who are proud and boastful. 4. 36. Sexual exploitation. The Arabs, during Jahiliya, the pre-Islam age of ignorance, as per their custom, maintained sexual relations with their slave girls but never gave them the social status of wives. According to the Quran, that was wrong. If a slave girl has not been freed for one reason or another and the master enjoys sex with her, it was his duty to elevate her to the status of a wife. In this way the Quran by one stroke of the pen changed the derogatory position of a slave girl to the high and axiomatic status of a wife. Their illicit relationships were made lawful and by giving axiomatic status to the strangeness of their relationship the Quran provided them with equality in marital life and their children were also given due social and legal standing at par with others who will be successful. They are those who guard their modesty. Successful are those who guard themselves against unlawful sex and every kind of sex perversion. But, lawful sex with wife or slave girl, elevated to the status of wife, is permitted. 23. 5 to 6. End of slavery. Thus the Quran brought an end to slavery. The problem of slaves who already existed in the Arab society was solved and the sources of recruiting new slaves were closed forever. Now the question is, why are methods of eradicating slavery still mentioned in the Quran? The answer is simple. If any community, engrossed with the problem of slavery, embraces Islam then the Islamic State has laws to tackle this predicament. The re-emergence of slavery. With the replacement of Islamic political system by monarchy, the Muslim society again adopted the customs and traditions of Jahiliya. Ignorant or uncivilized people. This un-Islamic way of life was accepted with such enthusiasm that it has become difficult to find an era in which slave girls in thousands were not present in harems of Muslim sultans. One may ask as to why Muslims reverted to the age of ignorance when they had with them the Quran with such clear instructions. Well, they have a back door called the tradition literature through which every brigand thought or act can undauntedly emerge. Therefore, traditions, hadith, 
were fabricated in favor of exploiting slave girls. And the tragedy is that these inhuman thoughts and shameless slanders have been attributed to the last messenger whose piety, modesty, integrity and self-control is beyond doubt. In the six true books of tradition, e Sitta, there exist such absurd traditions regarding slave girls that embarrass even the most shameless. We do not have the heart to reproduce them here. Nations opposed to Islam have declared that slavery and prostitution are crime but in the sacred city of Mecca slave girls are openly sold. Oh, would that I had died before this and had become a thing of naught, forgotten. 19. 23. This is all due to the tradition. Hadith. Literature because the Quran had put an end to slavery at a time when no nation had the wisdom to think on these lines. Today's Muslims continue to announce proudly from their pulpits and platforms that Islam put an end to slavery. Yet they themselves are the slaves of tradition and religious folklore. Toluwi Islam Trust 25B, Gulberg 2, Lahore, Pakistan Toluwi Islam at gmail.com